Thanks for having me. Um, as you said, I'm Jacob Bosley. I'm one of the hand and upper extremity surgeons at Desert Orthopedics. Um, happy to be here today to give you a little bit of information uh, about some of the things that I do um, and tell you also a little bit about myself. And then at the end, uh, as, as was said, we're gonna have a little bit of uh, time for questions because I think that's kind of the most important thing is that you get answered um, whatever questions you have that may arise. How do I advance this? That's my first question. Um, so as I said, I'm gonna try to introduce myself, give you a little bit of information about um, anatomy as well as some of the um, sort of language in that we use to talk about things in the hand um, so that we're all talking the same language um, as well as talk about some of our choices for anesthesia. We'll review some of the things that we can do short of surgery as well as talking about the surgery um, with some detail about them. Um, so about me, I'm an Ohio boy. Um, I've lived in multiple cities within Ohio and, and also did my schooling and my residency um, within Ohio, which in the past has meant that I'm a Browns fan and that's been very sad, but it has slowly gotten better as we've gotten a few more sports stars. I did go to Chicago um, for specialty training um, in which I did a year of training just on hand and upper extremity surgery. And then for six years prior to coming here, I was in North Carolina, um, where I was in practice there before I made my move to North, excuse me, before I made my move to California. And I like to tell people that um, LeBron followed me here because um, he thought it was a little bit better weather than Cleveland as well. Um, as I kind of alluded to, I want to make sure that we all have the same lingo because sometimes I think uh, patients and the doctors are sort of talking different languages and don't understand. Um, don't understand one another. So I'm gonna to try to give you a little bit of the information about the language in which we're talking to understand hand surgery. One of the things in hand surgery is it's a very broad um, field. There's lots and lots of things that we could talk about. Um, believe it or not, we could probably have an hour discussion just about fingernails and injuries to fingernails. I've sat in several lectures in which that was the main topic. There's also sort of odd and weird things that we see. Sometimes that people are born with some things that are developed over time. We'll talk about one of those today. Um, also different systemic illnesses that people have and how they present in the hand, as well as things that are just odd and just in general that happen for no particular reason. Um, so understanding the anatomy of the hand is very important. That's one of the things that really drew me into hand surgery was that I loved anatomy. The hand has very intricate anatomy. Um, some of what we're gonna talk about today um, are wrist fractures. That means the fracture of the distal radius, such as this bone here. And sometimes that's associated with a fracture of the distal ulna. There are eight little bones um, within what they call the carpus or these um, small bones that are at the base of the fingers. And then multiple bones that extend out into each finger. This is one of the things that makes hand unique. It's much more bone, excuse me, much more different bones, uh, a greater number of bones than you see in the hand, or excuse me, a greater number of bones than you see um, within the shoulder or the hip uh, or the knee. Um, also, the, as I said, the anatomy is very intricate. Not only are we talking about the bones, we are the orthopedic and the bone doctors, but in hand surgery, we also have to know a lot about all the structures within the hand, and that means a significant knowledge about the tendons, as well as all the nerves that run in the hand and the blood supply. Um, that's the main thing that gets us to heal our incisions, that gets us to heal our fractures and all of our wounds. So I wanted to talk about some of the things that I see most commonly within hand surgery and make sure that we're um, all understanding what, um, what we're talking about when we say these things. Carpal tunnel syndrome is one of the most common uh, diagnoses within all of orthopedics. Um, the carpal tunnel actually is a tunnel uh, that sits here at the base of your hand. These are um, some of those little carpal bones that we talked about at the base of the hand. They make up the bottom of the carpal tunnel and the top of the tunnel is this transverse carpal ligament or the flexor retinaculum, which is sort of the roof of the carpal tunnel. The carpal tunnel contains um, nine tendons and one nerve, the median nerve. It's compression of the nerve that gives people numbness and tingling out into their fingers. I tell people that's kind of the bottleneck where things are coming from your forearm to go out into your hand. They all go through this little tunnel at the base of your palm and then branch out as they go out into your fingers. And the tendons, they don't really care if they get squeezed, the nerve gets squeezed and that's what gives people numbness and tingling. This was described in 1854. The classic thing for this is numbness and tingling into the thumb, the index, the 
middle finger and half of the ring finger. It commonly wakes people up at night. Sometimes people say they have to shake their hand out. They feel like it's not getting blood supply, even though the actual problem is the compression of the nerve there at the carpal tunnel. And then they feel like they're clumsy, they're dropping things because they can't feel um, the, whatever they're touching at the tips of their fingers. It's also common that it, bothered by, it bothers people while they're driving. Um, it's the vibration of the road through the wheel um, that causes irritation of the nerve and it gives you numbness and tingling. Despite the classic um, presentation for a carpal tunnel, it's very frequent that people say, you know what, doc, all my fingers are numb. And it's not just numbness in my hand, I got numbness coming all the way up my arm. One of the classic things for it though is, is that it wakes you up from sleeping, that it's so bothersome, the compression of the nerve, that it'll wake you up from a dead sleep. It's well described that despite the classic presentation of numbness and tingling in your first, second, and third fingers, that it can be numbness into all your fingers as well as numbness all the way up to your arm, uh, excuse me, all the way up to your shoulder. Um, the first thing that we do in looking at um, somebody that has complaints of carpal tunnel syndrome is look at their hand. Um, just looking at it grossly, oftentimes I can tell if people have severe carpal tunnel, they'll start to lose this muscle. There's actually three little muscles here at the base of the thumb. And not only does that carpal tunnel nerve give the sensation to your index, uh, excuse me, your thumb, your index, and your long finger, but it also gives the power that innervates those three muscles. And with severe compression, you can start to lose that muscle. Um, we'll also do comparative sensation. How does your small finger feel with light touch in comparison to your index finger? The small finger has innervation via a different nerve, the ulnar nerve, um, whereas your median nerve is what gives sensation to those three um, digits that we've been talking about. Um, and then the sort of gold standard for evaluating for carpal tunnel syndrome is a nerve test called an EMG, which evaluates the speed at which the nerves conduct signal in your extremity to tell how, um, how the nerve is functioning. And if there's a spot that the nerve is getting compressed, that compression causes um, decrease in the signal to the nerve. And even in that study, they always compare you to the other hand to see how the nerve is functioning on one side versus the other, again, for that comparative uh, benefit. And it's very frequent that people come in, they get carpal tunnel and they say, well, doc, why did this happen to me? How, do I, how, how did I get this? What's the reason for it? And the most common reason is just what I call bad luck or idiopathic, which means it just happens. Um, it happens as a result of life in general, but this is a, the lengthy list of reasons that are possible causes for why you have carpal tunnel. Um, it's very extensive. Very often we can't put an exact reason on why it is. Um, historically, there was a lot of occupational things put into this um, that they thought it was related to typing. And when they've looked at um, occupational things related to carpal tunnel, they found that the worst one is running a jackhammer, that the vibration of the jackhammer irritates your hand. Not that many people run jackhammers, but it sort of translates into things like the vibration of the road when you're driving of holding onto, your wheel, onto the wheel. I see a lot of people here that riding their bicycle makes it worse. And again, it's the vibration of the handlebars within the palm. Um, that cause irritation of the nerve. Um, the treatment for carpal tunnel syndrome, um, I try to keep things simple. Um, the first one that I like to do is night bracing. Um, the, wearing the brace at night holds your wrist in a neutral position. It um, was a study done here, in, uh, excuse me, a study done by Dr. Gelberman um, where they put pressure transducers into people's palms and then they check to see which positions um, cause compression of the nerve. And it ends up being that the more extended your wrist is, the more flexed your wrist is, both of those are positions that compress the nerve and a lot of us sleep in that position. Um, at night, the brace holds you in a neutral position to prevent compression of that nerve. Um, there are also medications that are described for carpal tunnel syndrome. I'm not a big fan of either of these because I think they have significant side effects um, in a lot of people. Um, and I think sometimes the side effect is actually worse, um, is worse than the numbness and tingling in your fingers. Um, I do also do a lot of cortisone injections for carpal tunnel. We inject cortisone um, into that carpal tunnel. It helps to decrease swelling around those tendons and can give you long-term uh, relief from your carpal tunnel syndrome symptoms. Um, when we get to looking at the surgery for this, the surgery for carpal tunnel has changed significantly throughout the course of history as well. It's all about releasing that ligament. Um, this is a diagram showing that flexor retinaculum or transverse carpal ligament coming across the base of the palm. The bones are underneath all of these tendons and the median nerve that they're showing here. And it's releasing that uh, ligament. Historically, that was done through a four, five, six inch incision that started in your forearm and went up into your palm. 
over time, we've gotten smaller and smaller with the open carpal tunnel to the point that it's now just at the base of the palm where we just open enough that we can see that retinaculum and then divide the retinaculum to make more space for the nerve. I've gone to doing mine endoscopically, so we've gone from that four or six inch incision to now what ends up being about a half inch incision transversely at your wrist. What we're doing with that is putting a camera into that carpal tunnel. So it's sitting inside the carpal tunnel before we do anything sharp other than cut through the skin. And then we can see the top of that ligament. There's a knife that sits at the base of this camera that you activate with a little trigger here and it pulls the knife up. Once you've seen where the nerve is, you see that you have good visualization of the ligament. And then you can use that knife to divide the ligament. It's essentially the same thing that you're doing through the open incision, but now you can do it through a small incision in the palm. The benefit of doing it through the incision, or excuse me, the benefit of doing it through the camera is that you get a faster recovery. When they compared it, people get back to work, they get back to doing their normal things faster than having the incision in your palm. That's also where we put a lot of pressure when we go to get up from a seated position where it is when your tennis racket or your baseball um, bat sits and it causes the irritation within your hand. It's, not, it's nice not to have that incision in the base of your palm. And people can pretty quickly get back to doing their normal things. Um, carpal tunnel is a good one to start talking about what anesthetic choices we have. How are they gonna sedate you for surgery? And carpal tunnel is a good example because there are many different ways in which it can be done and with many different ways in which it is commonly done. Um, this is a list of our options, kind of going from the sort of greatest anesthesia or the most asleep to being completely awake. And we'll talk about each of those. General anesthesia is kind of the gold standard. It's what everybody typically thinks about with general, uh, excuse me, with any type of surgery is that you're all the way to sleep. You have the tube in your throat. You don't know anything about the operation. Downside of this is that you have the greatest complications of anesthesia. It also means that as you wake up from anesthesia, you're still very groggy um, for quite a while after surgery. Um, Carpal tunnel surgery can also be done under a regional block. Um, this is also done by the anest anesthesiologist, um, but they'll use an ultrasound to come up into different locations around um, your shoulder and numb up the nerves so that the, your arm is just anesthetized for the surgery. They can do it so that it can give you anywhere from a couple hours up to 24 hours of pain relief after surgery. Um, and that means you don't need as many pain meds after surgery. It also means you don't necessarily need as much anesthesia during the operation itself. They can just do a little bit of sedation associated with that nerve block. The third operation is just the sedation, and then we can add anesthetic through an injection um, in the area in which we're gonna inject, I mean, through the area in which we're gonna operate so that we can have that numbed up, plus we can have you sedated for the surgery. You're breathing on your own. You don't have to have any tube down your throat. And that allows um, for you to wake up faster. It still allows you to have some post-op pain control from the local block that we give you. Um, and it also means that for some of the things that we do in hand surgery, we can actually see you move, we can wake you up enough that you can move your fingers, but not in awake enough that you'll know anything about the operation. And especially for some of the like tendon things in the hand, that's really nice to see the actual tendon in motion. If we have to repair the tendon or to do something like that, we can actually see it working rather than just um, when they do them under general, it has to be repaired. And then we just hope that we have it set at the right uh, tension and in the right position for it to function for you. Whereas with the sedation, we can actually see you actively moving it before we even start to close up the skin. There's also an increasing um, movement towards what's called wall ant or wide awake anesthesia, wide awake local anesthetic without a tourniquet. Um, this is actually Dr. Lalonde, who's a Canadian uh, plastic surgeon who does hand surgery as well. Um, and he started doing more and more uh, operations um, without have, excuse me, without anesthesia where it was just done as a local block. Um, I think people first cringe at this thought, but it actually is uh, increasing movement. And it's, I try to tell people it's a lot like going to the dentist. We're gonna give you a local block. It's a little bit sore when you get the block, um, but it allows you to have a full operation. Um, without any of the risk of anesthesia. You're awake the whole time, you can listen to music, we can have a conversation about the operation the whole time um, and has some significant benefits to it. That being said, that's the only time I like to ever really be compared to a dentist. Um, other benefits of it, you don't have any sort of hangover or feel groggy after you wake up from surgery. You don't need any of the preoperative workup that you need with other things, so it ends up decreasing the overall cost. 
Um, it still allows you to actively move during surgery that if it's something that we need you to move. Um, this isn't good for all surgeries, but it is good for smaller surgeries. Next thing that we'll talk about is arthritis at the base of your thumb or basilar joint osteoarthritis. This is also, this can be the uh, basilar joint is here at the base of your thumb. It's the most common place in the hand that people get symptomatic arthritis. And it ends up being that our thumb works as a lever arm. So every tip of pressure that you apply to the tip of your thumb out here, the same forces are multiplied 12 or 13 times that same force when they get down to the base of your thumb. Also at the base of your thumb, there's a lot of movement. And over time, that ends up meaning that it wears out the cartilage or it wears out the sort of smooth surfaces on that until you get down to where it can be bone on bone, which is what they're trying to show in this image right here. And once it becomes bone on bone or once you wear out that, that excuse me, once you wear out that cartilage, you can develop symptomatic painful arthritis, especially associated with pinching and grasping type activities. Um, I tell people this is kind of mean arthritis. People say, I can lift a 25 pound bag of dog food, that's no problem, but boy, opening up a bottle or opening up um, a jar is really painful for me right at the base of my thumb. And these are painful everyday things that we do, like buttoning your shirt, pulling up your pants, um, opening a jar, all those cause pain. They also cause, a, they can cause a change in the alignment of your thumb or a change in the appearance of your thumb that actually looks like it's more sort of pronounced or bulging out at the base of your thumb. So what are the non-operative things that we can do for this? Some of those are changing the things that are painful for you. One of the very common ones that's painful is just holding a pin, especially a really skinny pin. It's hard to put the pinch on it without aggravating arthritis at the base of your thumb. So I think this is very helpful. These are little um, a styrofoam. It's almost like a styrofoam or a Nerf ball that you can put over top of your pencil. Um, my biggest problem is my son likes to take these off and play with them, um, but they really change how you hold the pen and they make it much easier so it doesn't load that joint and still allows you to do everyday things like writing. Um, this is another modifier that I really like. It allows you to open a jar just by using your fingers. That you don't have to put your thumb into it. It also has a really small opening at the base so that you can open your pill bottles with that. There's also braces that help to support um, that joint at the base of your thumb and to limit the motion of it, but still allow you the motion of the other joints of your thumb so you can still get through your normal everyday things and do your normal activities with it. Um, there's also cortisone injection, just like we showed injections for the carpal tunnel. We can inject into that joint at the base of your thumb. And I tell people that's sort of like taking 100 Advil and putting them right inside the joint to provide you with some long acting relief uh, from the pain. When the non-operative things um, stop working, then we start looking at what we, can we do operatively to get this pain better. The pain from basilar joint arthritis comes from this bone called the first metacarpal rubbing on the trapezium or the bone right below it. And this is an operation, there's several dozen different ways in which this is described, but almost all of them revolve removing that trapezium. When you get rid of the two bones that rub together, you get rid of that pain. Um, so it's almost like the first metacarpal is kind of floating above once you take that bone out. Historically, what has been done is some type of tendon, what's called a tendon interposition, that we take part of a tendon, usually we take half of this tendon called the, the, it's a wrist flexor tendon, and we ball that up and put it in the space that's left over once you've taken the bone out. And it's, I tell people it's sort of like taking a cushion um, so that there's a cushion in between the, or excuse me, there's a cushion where that bone was. So instead of the bone scraping against each other, now that bone is sitting on a cushion of tendon. Um, there's different approaches for it. I use what's called the Hemi, uh, Hemi Wagner. It's this incision at the base of your thumb. And then we take part of the tendon and then we'll wrap it around where that bone was taken out. Um, this is actually the way that I actually previously did it, um, but we wrap them around it almost like making a shock absorber or a little coil spring in there between two tendons so that the bone is suspended in place on this cushion of tendons. So this is the preoperative one, shows arthritis at that CMC joint, the base of the thumb. And then on the post-op x-ray, it literally looks like the thumb is floating in space. And that's because the tendon doesn't show up on the x-ray. After surgery, this needs some time to heal in. So I usually have people in a, a cast, the tip of their thumb is free, the thumb is immobilized, and the wrist is immobilized, and that's for about four and a half to five weeks. And then it's a good six weeks of therapy with wearing a brace in order to get back the motion of your thumb and to get back the strength. 
There have been some advances in how we do this surgery. And one of the things that I started doing is what's called the suture suspension plasty and taking, and excuse me, instead of taking that tendon and wrapping it to make that cushion in there, we take a big thick suture. The sutures uh, have developed in such a way that they can now make a very thick suture to use in place of that tendon. And what we do is we put an anchor that goes up into the base of your first metacarpal, and then we bring it out through the base of the first metacarpal and it suspends or holds it in there sort of like a suspension bridge to hold that thumb out to length. It allows you to do all the same things with your thumb, but has a faster recovery because we don't have to take that tendon from your forearm and it um, allows you to get back to normal things within about two and a half months or so. For this, fewer anesthetic choices. This is a little bit more of a, um, uh, it's a little bit more stimulating surgery to take that bone out. Most commonly it's done under general, uh, excuse me, a general anesthetic. There are people that do this under just regional anesthetic. And there's even some people that have done this under just the wide awake anesthesia, but they take a lot of time to numb up those nerves. I'm yet to do it that way. And I don't foresee myself doing it without anesthesia for at least quite a while. Our next common diagnosis um, is wrist fractures. As orthopedic surgeons, we're here to take care of um, when things sort of accidentally happen, something you wouldn't, didn't really plan on, unlike arthritis that happens over a long period of time, the fracture happens acutely really with any sort of planning or intent. The most common thing is just that you fall. Um, reflexively, you stick your hands out to keep yourself from hitting your head. And once that force becomes too, too great, you end up breaking the bone and it'll present with sometimes a visible deformity in the wrist as well as swelling in the wrist and also swelling out into the fingers. So sometimes something like Saul here, if you have a slip and fall, you need to call me instead of calling Saul. Um, first thing that we do is look at this on x-rays. So again, this is going back to the first slide that we had. This is bigger bone is called the radius. It's the one that's most commonly broken with any type of fall onto an outstretched hand. And we're looking to see how this compares to the smaller bone called the ulna. That's the little bump of bone on your wrist. We want those to be equal in length. Sometimes one gets impacted and all of a sudden you have two bones that are different lengths and then that throws off the mechanics of your wrist. We also wanna look at how is the joint surface. I tell people it looks kind of like a smiley face sitting right here. That's where the motion of your wrist flexing and extending occurs. The non-operative treatment for this is usually about five, four and a half to five weeks in a cast. Um, even though you broke your wrist, it affects the flexion, or excuse me, it affects the function of your fingers, and we worry about stiffness and swelling in your fingers, even though your break is down here on your wrist. We want to get those fingers moving right away. We also monitor it with serial x-rays to make sure that maybe the bones started equal in length, but over time they can settle, that there can be change in position of the bones, um, depending upon the force that goes into them with the original injury, um, as well as the quality of the bone itself. Um, this, the casting was for a long time was the only treatment that we had. And then starting probably 50 years ago, maybe even 60 years ago, people started doing external fixators, which is two pins that went into the base of your second metacarpal, into the base of your hand out here, and then two pins that went into your wrist. And then it was connected with some type of a connective bar to angle your wrist to try to improve the alignment and pull that radius back out to length. This for a long time was the standard of care for wrist fractures in a, that were treated surgically. Um, now we've gone to the volar locking plate. This was designed in about 2000 and has really revolutionized how we treat wrist fractures to the point now that I do about one or two external fixators a year, um, whereas I'll do one or two volar locking plates every week. This allows us to put hardware that goes inside of the wrist to stabilize on all sides of the fracture with screws that are connected by a plate. It's done through a single small incision on the wrist, which I'll show you here in just a second. It allows us to get you moving at the wrist, oftentimes within the first week of surgery and get you started in therapy faster to get you from, excuse me, to keep you from getting stiffness in your wrist. For these, they're generally done under a um, full anesthetic or a general anesthetic. It can be um, supplemented with a regional block where they numb you up and that means less anesthesia and also that 24 hours of pain relief after surgery. Um, this is a lady that um, I fixed her one wrist. Um, it shows the incision here. Unfortunately, she fell and she broke her other wrist. So um, I wanted to show that it can be done through a pretty small incision and then over time the scars fade out. 
this side was still within a year of the other side. So the scars can remodel for a year and they can get not quite imperceptible, but they can get um, fairly so they're not very noticeable. And again, it's a faster return um, to normal activities. Um, a fourth diagnosis I'd like to talk about is called Dupuytren disease. And this is another diagnosis that I frequently see in the office. It's also commonly called Viking's disease. It's a contracture of the palm that's thought to tie back all the way to having Viking heritage. It's almost uniquely in people of Northern European ancestry um, that develop these painless contractures in their palm that slowly cause the fingers to draw down. This is a, this is a disease of the palmar fascia. The palmar fascia, if you touch onto your palm, is what makes your palm kind of tough. So it's not squishy like your forearm. But in people with Dupuytren's disease, they'll develop a nodule or a cord in that um, palmar fascia, and over time, that can draw down. It has kind of an interesting history on a number of different points. Um, it was first really, or it's first sort of named by a French surgeon, Baron Dupuytren, who first described it in 1831. But in, if you look in the records, there's descriptions of people having Dupuytren's contractures well before that. But it's this odd kind of thing where over time you can just painlessly have your finger draw down and you can't extend it. It usually starts with a thickening within the palm. Oftentimes there'd be like a, feels like a little knot or a nodule in there. Um, and it, over time it can slowly draw down. It's a genetic disorder that it's usually shared within families, but it's sporadic um, in its inheritance, meaning that sometimes several members in one generation will have it. No one will have it for two or three generations. And again, several other members will have it. If you're a real hand nerd, people like to talk about whether or not the papal sign, the Pope waving is that he maybe had significant Dupuytren's disease. There's also some theory that he had a nerve injury that caused his fingers to draw down like that, but it wasn't that the Pope couldn't wave like, or didn't want to wave like normal. He just couldn't wave like normal. Um, when this gets down to usually it's above 30 degrees or it's where you can't get your hand flat on a tabletop, then we start talking about what can you do for Dupuytren's disease. The gold standard for Dupuytren's is surgical excision where we actually make this kind of zigzag incision in your hand and we go in and we actually cut out that cord that's causing the contracture. It, it, it is literally a physical limitation that keeps you from fully extending your finger. Um, I thought this was a neat intraoperative photo. This is showing the digital nerve or the nerve that gives you sensation to the outside of your finger. And then underneath of it is the cord. And this is one of the sort of challenges in surgery is that cord and the digital nerve can be very intricately um, located to one another also, that cord has pushed the nerve out from where its normal location is. And this is also why anatomy is so important to me. Excuse me, anatomy is so important to me is because we have to sort of know what the normal is. And then we also have to know what the abnormal is to expect. And Dupuytren's is a prime example of that. There's another um, treatment called a needle aponeurotomy in which instead of opening your whole hand up, um, you can percutaneously go in with a needle and use the edge of a needle like a knife to weaken that cord. And if you weaken it enough, then the cord eventually pops open. Um, this is most common, or the most famous surgeon for this is Charlie Eaton, who's now retired, but was out in Florida uh, and would go in percutaneously without, so people didn't have to have any anesthesia, um, but could do this in the office and weaken that cord enough to bring your hand out to near full extension. One of the things, in, or excuse me, one of the ways in which Dupuytren surgery, despite sort of being dating all the way back into the 1800s has progressed is just within the last 10 or 15 years. Um, there's an injection developed called Zyaflex, which, which is specifically designed to dissolve that cord. It's an enzyme that's designed to weaken that cord so that you can just have three little injections along that cord. Two or three days later, we bring you into the office and we can actually manipulate your finger to pop that cord and to bring it out to near full um, extension. More and more people are actually getting away from doing the surgery and going towards doing the Zyaflex injection if they can. One of the downsides of Zyaflex is not every cord um, is amenable to Zyaflex. Um, there has to be sort of certain positions of the cord and certain, posi um, certain locations of the cord to make it amenable. And that's one of the things that we evaluate you for in the office. It is nice that you get to avoid the operating room completely. You get back to doing your normal activities faster. You don't have to have any hand therapy. You don't have any big zigzag scar going down your hand. One of the downsides, however, is that it does leave you with some residual disease. It doesn't dissolve the entire cord. It dissolves sections of the cord to weaken it. With surgery, I do think you get a better correction. 
It's amenable to almost all um, types of Dupuytren's cords that occur, but it does make a longer recovery. It's more involved that you have to do some therapy on it, and, but it does allow us to the, remove all of, the, all of the disease tissue within your hand. Regardless of whether you do a surgery, Zyaflex, or even the needle aponeurotomy that we discussed previously, all of them come with a risk of recurrence. I tell people that um, Dupuytren's is a genetic disorder. When we do the surgery or we do Zyaflex, it's taking out the product of your, genetic, or of your genetics. It's not changing your genetics. So all of them come with a risk of recurrence or the um, cord coming back. If it does come back, just like the way the same as it started, it comes back generally very slow. Our fifth common diagnosis that we're gonna talk about is trigger finger, um, which kind of sounds a lot cooler than it really ends up being. It has nothing to do with shooting guns or doing anything illegal with your hands, um, but it's a catching of your finger. Um, this is a very common diagnosis. It's very common in the general population, but it's actually four times more prevalent in patients with diabetes. It's the locking of your finger in a flex position as is shown in the picture here. And what happens is, is um, the normal anatomy is as your tendon goes down your finger to make your finger flex, starting right at the base of your palm or right in this area, the tendon starts to go into a little tube. And that tube actually holds the tendon down to the bone. Under normal anatomy, that tube is for mechanical advantage. It's to get you more power out of your tendons, to get you more um, ability to make a fist. And then what happens as the, the pathoanatomy or what happens when things go bad is you get swelling in that tendon. And then when you make a fist, it has to pull underneath of that tube and it gets stuck. And then it gets stuck in that position. You have to kind of think about it and then it'll pop open and it can progress to the point where you have to use your other hand to pull it open. And under rare circumstances, it can progress to the point where you can't pull it open, where it just stays flexed. I tell people it's sort of like the truck pa passing underneath of the over, uh, excuse me, a truck passing underneath of the overpass. If you have too big a truck, it's gonna get stuck under there and that's when your finger gets um, uh, left in that flexed position. So there are some non-operative things that we can do for this. This picture is showing what's called a trigger finger ring. If you block the motion at your first knuckle here, you can keep that finger from triggering. I don't like these for very long-term use because they end up making your finger stiff. If you don't bend at that knuckle, it will make it stiff. Um, Anti-inflammatories can be used, meaning Aleve and ibuprofen. If you catch this very early, if you start having one or two times in which it catches and you start anti-inflammatories, you can keep it from continuing to progress. But one of the most common things that we do for this is cortisone injection where we're injecting at the base, right where that tube starts. And we can inject here and patients will often feel it come up along the tendon to coat the entirety of that tendon with cortisone. 70% of the time with one injection, we can get the triggering to go away and never come back. It almost always gets it better, um, but 30% of the time it does come back. And when that does come back, then we talk about the, op uh, me, then we talk about the surgery for this. Um, the surgery is a fairly straightforward surgery, especially in the realm of hand surgery, um, where we're going in and releasing that covering on the tube where the knot in the tendon or the swelling in the tendon is getting stuck. Um, this is a perfect example of one I like to do with patients awake or at least partway awake. And that's because I want to see you actually flexing and extending your fingers. So we'll make sure that before we start to put in any stitches that all your catching is gone. We can actually elicit that triggering or that catching of your finger in the operating room. And one of the best ways to check if um, we've successfully released the trigger is to actually try to make you trigger. And if it's done triggering, then we go ahead and put stitches in. Um, this is a fairly fast recovery. You're covered in a bandage for about four or five days. You're allowed to move your fingers immediately. And then I take the stitches out in about 10 days after surgery. Um, that's about the end of the slides that I have. Um, this is a picture of my son and I. Um, I think we left a fair amount of time. If we have any questions, um, I can field anybody's questions now. Joining us, and thank you, Dr. Bosley. It was a great presentation. Yeah. I think it was uh, very informative and uh, very helpful. Thank you so much. Excellent.